Hi, I'm Mike Cutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. This module will discuss the basics of energy terminologies and terms. Let's say a few words about energy sources to initial. First of all, there are two basic sources of energy in the cow's ration. Carbohydrates, which consists of fiber and non-fiber components. More about that a bit later. The second major contribution would be fats and oils. There is a third source, which would be proteins, but generally we hope that never happens. And that's a last resort because it's very expensive and very energy inefficient to use proteins as an energy source. Let's look at different ways to express energy content in a diet. The traditional way was called TDN, Total Digestible Nutrients. This measurement was expressed as a percent, for example, 70% TDN on a ration, or as pounds. I feed my cows 20 pounds of TDN. Either reference can be used. TDN is calculated by summing up the percent or the amount of digestible protein. And by the way, a good protein figure, for those who want to be interested, is about 70% of the protein should be digestible, which means the other 30% comes out in fecal and urine losses. Digestible crude fiber, and that's a very low number, as you'll see a bit later, because of digestibility of some of the non-digestible lignin fractions, 30 to 40%. Digestible nitrogen-free extract, and that's about 80%. For some of us, that's an unusual term. Nitrogen-free extract really is sugar and starches. So it's very high digestible, and of course, pigs, chickens, and humans can handle this very nicely. And the fourth component will be digestible ether extract, which is actually your fats and oils. A fairly high number is 60 to 80 percent. And then note, multiply by 2.25. And the reason for that is fat is two and a quarter times more calorically dense and based on its carbon content. The second energy system used and most common now in the U.S. and Canada is the net energy system. Net energy is what's available after we remove all the losses. More about that in just a few minutes. You will find three different terms listed for each feedstuff. Net energy maintenance. So it says, what's the energy content if this cow uses it to stay alive? Net energy lactation or any L, and that L is small, that is if I take this energy and produce milk out of it, or net energy gain, which means if I am a calf or a heifer or a young cow, I will use that energy for gain or growth on the animal. So you'll see three different terms. The good news is that for dairy cattle, net energy M or maintenance and net energy lactation or L are almost equal, and therefore many feed tables will only list two terms instead of three. Let's take then a look at how energy is partitioned. We're using a typical 60% alfalfa, 40% corn-based diet for a lactating cow. We start out on the left side with what we call gross energy. So if I had a pound of straw and a pound of corn, they would have about the same gross energy. But now we put it through the cow's digestive system. We then come up with a term called digestible energy. Digestible energy says if I take what is lost in the manure or feces, what's left over is called digestible energy. And a lactating cow, that's about 30% of the total energy ends up in the manure. Therefore, anything I can do to increase feed digestibility, forage quality, feed processing, that's a winner because I mean I increase that 70% up to a higher number. Next, I go from digestible energy to something called metabolizable energy. This is very common in Europe. They do a lot of ration balancing there, also with pigs and poultry. You will see why in just a minute. Metabolizable energy then is about 60% of the total, and I lose another 5% in urine losses of energy and also 5% in gas losses. That is your methane. That is your greenhouse gas, and that's why rumenzin. The onophore will lower that number and why rumenzin makes feed higher valued for dairy cattle is we reduce that loss down. Finally, we, once we go from metabolizable energy, or ME, we go to something called NE. Remember, we talked about that earlier, net energy. So it says, once I pay all my taxes, if you wish, taxes of manure, urine, and gases, then I have net energy, and that's about 40% of the total, which means that animal can then use that for some function. More about that in just a minute. What are those losses that we went from metabolizable to net energy? Well, that is the rumen. That is basically the fermentation losses, the heat generated, the rumen, microbial growth, those kinds of factors. And that's why in pig diets, it doesn't become a factor because pigs don't have rumens. The newest equation coming out of the NRC 2001 would be called the summative equation. 
You'll notice it's very similar to some of the earlier things we talked about, but this was developed by Dr. Bill Weiss at The Ohio State University and was adapted by the NRC. The summative equation simply adds these ones together, and but a little different twist. The TDN then is calculated by taking true digestibility. That's what the TD stands for. Very difficult to analyze in a lab, but critical, of course, for the cow. Truly digestible NDF or neutral detergent fiber, which is a cell wall, plus truly digestible NFC, which of course is your sugars and starches and pectins, plus the truly digestible fatty acids, or FA, fatty acids. That's your fats and oils. And there sits that 2.25 again, as we talked about a bit earlier. And then finally, the truly digestible, or TD, crude protein, and then you minus 7 as a constant. And that comes through a regression equation, and that is how we now calculate TDN in our model and in our new NRC. Okay, now we've gotten to the net energy. We say, okay, I've got so many mcals of net energy available to do something. And most high-producing dairy cow rations, that's around 30 to 40 mcals. Well, the first thing this cow will do is stay alive. We call that the maintenance requirement. That is to keep warm, to walk around, to replace warm out tissue, to breathe, to digest feed, and factors like that. That's about 10 megs a day, or megacals. Some people call megacals megs. Then that will increase, however, if you have cows on pasture or they have to walk long distances to the milking parlor. So just like you and I exercising, maintenance will go up if we exercise. Also, if we have heat stress or cold stress, the cow will expend energy to cause those functions to keep her in a comfort zone. Another cost will be growth. In the heifers, this is very, very high in calves. But for lactating cows, first lactation cows, a nice thumb rule is about 20% of the maintenance cost will be required for growth. So if you have 10 megs, that means about another 2 megs each day is spent on growing this animal to meet her mature size. Second lactation cows, this is only 10%. Obviously, your heifer rearing program will have a huge factor determining these numbers should be slightly higher or lower. A third choice the cow has to spend this energy is reproduction. And this becomes a very large number, especially in the last two or three months. It increases gradually day by day. And that's been a new change in the NRC. But notice, that can be as high as three megs a day. And of course, this is for one calf and not twin. Right now in the U.S., we're seeing a much higher percent of cows twinning, as high as 8 to 10 percent. And that would increase that demand for energy as well. Another choice she has is weight gain. A cow can gain weight just like a human can gain weight, and that is 2.3 megs for each one pound of body weight gained. If she loses weight, she gives up a similar amount of energy for other functions. And of course, finally, the real reason we have milk cows is to produce milk. And it takes about 0.31 megs per pound of milk containing 3.5% milk fat. If it's a jersey, that number will go up. So now the next question is, if this cow has 35 megs, how does she spend them each day? Kind of like, how do you spend your check that goes to the bank each day? Well, first of all, the cow is going to stay alive. She is not dumb. So that'll be your first requirement. Notice this is early lactation because these will change around. Generally speaking, her next, she is genetically bred to produce milk. Her second requirement or diversion will be milk eel, and she will produce copious amounts of milk and milk fat. Thirdly will be the other three growth, weight gain, and reproduction, which means that if a cow runs out of energy after the first two, she may not cycle, she may not gain weight, and she may not grow. And that's what happens in cows in early lactation on a number of farms. Now let's switch the timeline a bit to late lactation cows. How do they partition energy? And you'll notice she still wants to stay alive. Not a dumb cow. Now, however, if she becomes pregnant, she now protects the fetus. So that becomes a second. So she will give up all other bodily functions to maintain pregnancy on that calf. Then will come growth and or milk yield. This one is not quite as clear which one will happen first. And of course, finally will be weight gain. So you can see a cow in late lactation. If she is thin, you really have to be sure we pay all these other energy costs first before she will gain body weight for the next lactation. 
Of course, many of us know there is another energy partitioning agent called bovine somatotropin, or BST. And you will see BST will actually change the rules a little bit and actually encourage or drive the cow to produce more milk production. And so you will see that will actually increase milk production. Therefore, if you do not have enough energy in the ration, one of these third, fourth, or fifth partitions have to give it up. Therefore, a key concern with BST is having adequate nutrients to meet the extra six or eight or 10 pounds of milk the cow will produce. Next, let's look at our various energy sources in the diet. First one is acid detergent fiber, abbreviated ADF. This consists of cellulose, much like cellulose you'll find in other plant products, and lignin, which is very indigestible or zero. This will be known as a cell wall of the plant. That's why the plant stands up and why she is rigid. Therefore, if you have brown midrib corn, which is low in lignin, sometimes it will go down in wind or it'll appear droopy. This digestibility is modestly low, typically as low as 30 to 40 percent. This ADF increases as the plant matures. That's why the plant becomes more woody, such as straw, and is very important and useful in some ways to predict energy content based on this fraction. High ADF, low energy content. A second fiber fraction related to energy is neutral detergent fiber, or NDF. This would be all the cell wall. It includes both ADF, we talked about earlier, and hemicellulose. The good news, hemicellulose can be 60 or 70% digestible, such as corn bran would be a good example. So it is modestly high in digestibility. Therefore, NDF should always have a slightly higher digestibility or energy content than would be an ADF fraction type feed. This will control dry matter intake, also known as fill factor. So if you have too much NDF, you just can't eat as much feed. And that's why some people eat bulky uh, dietary supplements, even on the human side. And again, as with ADF, it increases as the plant matures. Perhaps a diagram would be very useful to see these same components. You may have to study this one a bit later and print it out. You, we talked about cell contents. That's what's inside the cell wall. Let's talk about that as an M&M. This would be the peanut inside or the milk chocolate inside of your M&M. And you can see all the goodies are in there. Protein, sugar, fat, starches, and pectins. Very, very digestible. That is then surrounded by the cell wall. That is what protects the cell, gives it rigidity, and increases as a plant matures. You can see on the bottom half, and this drawing complements a pioneer, by the way, you can see how the cell wall is built. You can see the green area as being cellulose. Lignin is kind of the cement that's in there. And then you can see hemicellulose, which is the more digestible fractions. And as we said earlier, you can see how ADF and NDF terminology relates to that. As the plant mature, this these cell walls get thicker and unfortunately the lignin content gets higher. And if that lignin content surrounds your M&M, or in this case a cell wall, it walls off or reduces the availability of the highly digestible components such as sugars, starches, and proteins. When we look at forage analysis and feed evaluation table, you see this very cumbersome table, but really it's very easy if we just look at it and study it briefly. You actually have the two most common systems used in the United States. The old system is on your left. This is the old crude fiber system, also known as the Wiendi system, which came from the German gentleman who discovered the system. And you can see, therefore, we have how these nutrients fall in and into the various categories. Nitrogen-free extract, sugar, starches, pectin, hemicelluloses, and alkaline soluble fiber. That's a problem. We wish it wasn't there. Crude fiber, you can see made up of alkaline insoluble and also cellulose. So you can see that's one of the weaknesses. Crude fiber gets split up into different categories. It's not nearly as diagnostic. On the right side is the detergent system, championed by Van Soest, a researcher at Cornell. And now you can see here comes your ADF and NDF systems. And I superimpose on that on red is cell cell wall and cell contents. I went through that pretty fast, but I think you need to study that a bit if you wish or stop your computer to kind of see how these fit together and how the fractions come together. If you understand these last two slides, you are a fairly good nutritionist. One of the common questions we get, and that is, well, what's the energy content of a grain mix I may buy from the local elevator or from a commercial company? Here is a Hutchins thumb rule that says you can calculate the TDN in a grain mix on an as-fed basis.
It is based on the energy value of corn. And we can then use values that are on a feed tag to try to estimate within reason an energy content of that feed. The concept simply is that as energy increases, that fat content goes up. That should make sense to you now. We should also understand that energy content decreases as ash increases. That's mineral. That's rock. And there is no, there is no carbon in rock. Therefore, there can't be any energy. And we already know that as fiber increases, that decreases digestibility and decreases energy content. So the formula is simply based on corn. And so if I use the corn values, that's how I came up with this formula. So on an as-fed or 90% dry matter base, you take 80, the energy TDN value of corn, subtract the crude fiber that's on your tag. Corn has 2%, by the way, so you can see these numbers all zero out. But if you had a feed tag that had 5% crude fiber, then you'd have to subtract 3 from 80. The ash content, we mentioned no energy in ash. So you may have a grain that has some sodium bicarb in it. It may have some salt. It may have some diacal, some limestone. But corn is about 2% ash. You may have 6% ash. So now you subtract another four percentage points from your base of 80 because you have more ash than corn. And finally, we adjust for fat. And you can see corn runs about 3% fat. Yes, there's high oil corn. You would have to make that adjustment. That's why they call it high oil corn. But you can see if you had a product that had 3% or let's say 6% fat, then you would take 6 minus 3 and there comes that 2.25 again. In this case, you would now add back about 7 units of TDN and that would give you a pretty good estimate. You may ask what happened to protein, and the answer is protein has about the same energy content as what other starches and feeds would have, so it's pretty much neutral on the TDN value. It is not used in the formula. So let's summarize this module by a few take-home messages. First, understand there are several forms of energy. There are the net energy system, the TDN system here used in the U.S. and around the world. If you're in Europe, it's going to be a metabolizable energy basis. Number two, cows will partition energy based on various stages of lactation and reproductive status. Thirdly, you must understand and remember that as fiber and ash go up, that reduces the level of energy in a diet. Meanwhile, if you buy a product that's high in fats and oils, you will have more energy and therefore is worth more when you buy it commercially. And finally, there are several sources of fiber in the diet with varying amounts of availability. We'll talk more about this in some of the other modules, but that completes this one. Thanks. Have a great day.